Your Bible's turn with us to Genesis 16. Get you some missionaries to pray for tonight. Homecoming Sunday. Amen. We're looking forward to homecoming. Brother John Mitchell's coming up. His wife, he said today, his wife wasn't going to make it with him, but he's going to be here, and we're looking forward to it. Amen. Good preacher, good man of God, good food, good fellowship, just a good time in the Lord. Amen. So, amen. Don't forget about that Sunday. I thought about something today, amen, and give you a little charge, something to do, amen, invite somebody out for homecoming. Maybe pull your telephone out and go down through all your contacts and maybe find some people in there that you haven't seen in a while or you'd like to invite to church and send them a message, invite them to homecoming Sunday, amen. Go down through there, and man, I'm sure you can get a lot of people invited like that through your contacts, amen, so never know who, who's in there you probably ain't done forgot all about. Amen. So invite them to church. Amen. If everybody here done that, probably be over 500 people invited to church. If you don't do it during service, that's a good idea. Wait, wait till you get home, start tomorrow, and you, it's your homework. Amen. The rest of the week. Amen. So that's coming up Sunday. Preacher's Fellowship's Friday. We'll be heading up to uh, Salisbury to Brother Sadler's Church, Victory Baptist Church. We'll be leaving here at 5 o'clock. Anybody want to go to the Preacher's Fellowship? Amen. So 5 o'clock Friday. Amen. If you're able uh, and you got a little time tonight, we'd like to uh, clean that fellowship hall up, sweep it and mop it real good, and set up the tables for homecoming, so that'll be ready for Sunday. So if you're able to hang around with us, do that. Amen. Also, two things I want to remind you of again. One of them we've been mentioning a lot, lot uh, want the other one not as much, but we are still praying for a van driver, somebody to run the van ministry and pick up people and bring them to church. So if you are looking for some type of a ministry, the way to get involved, something to do with your life, pray about it and ask God if he'd want you to do it. Let us know, amen. We'll put the keys in your hand let you go start picking up people, bringing them to church, filling it up, amen. Bringing sinners in and saints and, and helping the cause of Christ. So we need that, that ministry fail, filled so if somebody can't sit around and hope well and say, there's nothing for me to do. There's plenty to do, amen. Also, Brother James and them will be heading to the Blackfeet Indian soon. And the Lord continue to lead there. So that's going to open up that ministry with the kingdom kids. And I know uh, Andre and Brother Richie's been helping with it, but they're going to need somebody to fill that place. So we need somebody to pick up that ministry, amen, and continue to reach out to those kids in the projects and, and get them the gospel, amen. So anybody interested in that, let us know, amen. So, And if you just kind of burden with something to do other than that, let us know and we'll find you something to do, amen. So plenty of things to pray about, plenty of things to get involved. Amen. Genesis chapter 16. We began last week looking at this chapter. Lord willing, we'll finish it tonight. Abraham and Sarah's, Sarah's work of the flesh. After that great work of faith in chapter 15 where Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness, the next chapter is the complete opposite. Instead of believing God and stepping out by faith, he begins to operate in the flesh. Amen. From faith to the flesh and back to the Father is what we call the chapter. Verses 1 and 2, we see the trial of the faith, of their faith. Verse 2, the second and third part of verse 2, and through verse 6, we see the trusting in the flesh. And then in verse 7 through 16, the turning to the Father. So let's read the chapter. Amen. Verse number 1. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had an handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarah... Uh, said unto Abram, uh, Behold, now the Lord have restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai, just like Adam did in the beginning when he hearkened to the wife of uh, his wife, the voice of his wife. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took, her, uh, took, her, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abraham had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. And he went, into, went in unto Hagar, and she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee, I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes, the Lord judge between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sarah, I behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarah dwelt hardly with her, she fell 
uh, fled from her face. Excuse me. Verse 7. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to shore. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, whence comest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself unto her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it uh, shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord have heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man, and he will uh, be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he, and he shall dwell uh, in the uh, presence of, his, of all his brethren. And she called uh, the name of uh, she and she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore the well was called Berlehora. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered, and Hagar bare Abraham a son. And Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare Ishmael. And Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. Let us pray tonight. Amen. Brother Nolan, how about pray for us, brother? Amen. Last week we seen the trial of their faith, amen, and how, or, and how Abraham and Sarah was, time and time their life was tried by the Lord, and sometimes they were successful and sometimes they failed. And it's a type of how our life is as Christians, amen. There's always trials that we face one after another, and a lot of times uh, the trials come after great successes in our lives, and then we seen that in the life of Abraham. And then we begin to see in verse 2 the ter, uh, ter, trusting in the flesh. After the trial of their faith in verse number 1, now Sarah, Abram's wife, bear him no children. She's like, hey, I just can't win for losing. It's like one thing after another. It's up and then it's down, amen. In this case, amen, instead of trusting the Lord back like he did in chapter 15, they both trust their flesh. Sarah said, well, here's the plan. This is what we'll do. Hey, man, you lay with my handmaid, and we'll get some children that way, and that'll fulfill the promise of God. And boy, they made a mess out of that one, amen. And anytime you leave the Lord's promises and trust in your flesh and lose your patience towards the Lord, you're going to make a mess of your life. And we saw this in the life of Abram and Sarah in chapter 16, that one sin led to another. Abraham laid with Hagar, and then Sarah said, hey, man, I'm guilty. This thing, we done made a mess. I'm despised before her now that she's with child, and I don't have any, and now what am I going to do? And Abraham said, man, hey, you do whatever you want to do with it. I, my hands are clean. I think when you get to chapter 16 and verse 6, and Abraham said to Sarah, behold, thy maid is in thy hand do to her as it pleases thee. I believe Abraham's kind of threw up his hands and said, man, I'm tired of this mess. You ask me to lay with her, we get a child, now I got this, one thing after another, and sooner or later you just can't take no more. You ever been like that? Enough is enough, man. You do what you want to do with it. Instead of being a leader in his home and trying to put this thing back in order, one sin leads to another, he turns down over to her. Now you just run the house. And boy, you sing the mess that come out of that, and she runs her away. Abraham goes from a man of fate to the man of failure. He lost fellowship with the Lord 13 years over this instance. 13 years are gone out of his life where he wastes away out of fellowship with God. And hey, and how our lives can turn out the same way. Hey, you say, preacher, my life's real good right now and I'm going well. I'm glad it is and I hope it stays that way. But if it can happen to Abraham, the friend of God, 13 years out of fellowship with God, we better take heed, amen, it could happen to you and I also. It could take place. 
It's one thing to believe the promises of God. It's another thing to wait patiently to it for it to come to pass. And we saw this last week, amen. And we're going to pick back up in verse 3 tonight. We're not going to rehash all that. You go get the tape, man. It's pretty good stuff there in the beginning of this chapter. But verse 3 says, And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abraham had dwelt 10 years in the land of Cana, and gave her to her husband Abraham to be his what? Wife. Now, of course, here, here's his wife Sarai. Now there's going to be another wife in the picture. He's going to lay with uh, Hagar, and she's going to become his wife. And the Bible says in verse number 4, And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she was conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. So we have this little truth we'll just hit on the way of passing the what is a biblical marriage. Amen. He said, she said, Sarah, I said, take her, amen, and, and, and I give her to thee to be, uh, you be her husband and she be your wife. And he laid one and there was a marriage. Biblical marriage is flesh joining flesh. A biblical marriage is not a certificate. You say, well, preacher, a lot of, you know, here's the way that thing is. You got one crowd over here that tries to just condemn somebody that's been married again. Let me, let me just stop and back up just for a minute. God is for one marriage. Amen. All right? God has never been for divorce. God don't want you to get divorced. God wants you to stay together. God wants you to wait on the right one, marry the right one, stay with the right one, and serve the Lord. That is God's plan. But it don't always happen like that. Sometimes we operate in the flesh. Hey, sometimes the one you marry operates in the flesh. Amen. Hey, hey, but what is a marriage? There's one crowd that says, well, if you've been married more than one time, your life is a waste. You can't do nothing but give tithes and sit on the pew. They don't mind you giving tithes, but you can't preach, and you can't be a deacon. You know, you're double married and all that kind of stuff, so your life's a mess. And God ain't in that neither, amen. And then there's the other crowd over here who said, well, preacher, biblical marriage is flesh, joining flesh, so I don't need to get a certificate, amen. We already married. We shacked up, amen. That'll work too. One wrong don't make another thing right, amen. Hey, the truth you'll find is always right down the middle, amen. Hey, yes, a certificate does not make a marriage. Somebody say, well, I've only got one certificate. I'm more holy than you are. But they laid with 17 women on the way to get that certificate. And you've been married biblically more than one time. You just got one certificate, amen. Then you got the other crowd over here that says, well, preacher, you don't need to, you know, a certificate, amen. We already just consummated this thing, and so we're biblically married. What does it matter? You know what matters? The world's watching you, and there's nothing wrong with obeying the land, laws of the land if it's not going to affect you doing what's right by God. So there's a balance in all things. Yes, we know she, he laid with her and she became his wife. That is a biblical marriage. Let me just hit this thing. Matthew chapter 19. Hold your place here. Matthew 19. A biblical marriage. God's for one, one marriage, but it don't always work like that. But it don't make you any less of a person if you've been divorced. But let me say this. According to uh, 1 Corinthians, it ain't gonna, uh, it's going to probably cause a lot of trouble in your flesh. Especially if you've had children. In a previous marriage. And God said he has not sinned if he remarries. I'm not trying to preach a doctrinal message on marriage and uh, remarriage and divorce tonight. But I'm just going to hit this thing as we go through here. Hey, hey, but it don't make you any less of a person. But it, it don't mean you might go have some trouble in the flesh because you've done it. Now you got parents and children going back and forth. And uh, you can imagine, you know how it works. It's a mess. You got them over here spending one week over here with somebody that don't love God and then they're coming back over here to somebody that does love God because you married a heathen. And now that it didn't work out, now you're divorced because you should have never been yoked up with an unbeliever to start with. That's one of the scenarios. And now you're divorced and now that heathen gets them one every other weekend and they raise them like hell and then you bring them back try to get them back to serve the Lord. Now you young is in a yo-yo. Can God be merciful and help you? Yes, he can. But there's going to be trouble in the flesh if it happens. Amen. What is a marriage? Matthew uh, chapter 19. Jesus said this in verse number 3. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? That's the question. Is it lawful? Look at verse 4. And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read 
That'll help out a whole lot if you just read what the book says. He that made them at the beginning made them male and let me just hit that as we go about. A marriage is a male and a female. You should, you, who would ever thought you had to hit that over and over in a, in a, in a, in a, a congregation of saints? It's not two males. It's not two females. It's a male and a female. That's the way it was in the beginning. That's how God ordered it to be. Anything outside of that is not biblical and it is sin. You say, preacher, that, that, that just condemns my sodomite friends. Well, they need to be condemned. It's not right by God, and it is a sin. Amen. God said, I made it that way in the beginning. The question is, is it lawful to marry? He said, well, first of all, let's figure out what a marriage is. It's a male and a female. Verse number four, and, and, and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be what? What made them one flesh? Cleaving. We'll leave it at that. It wasn't they went before the priest. It ain't the way they stood before the Baptist preacher. He said, preacher, well, if it's flesh joining flesh, why well, I need to stand before the Baptist preacher? Because you ought to want to be a testimony to a world. Amen. That knows the difference of somebody wanting to spend their life with somebody and somebody just wanting to shack up to justify your sin. You know, it, you know what it is? It's just like Peter said. It's just like any other heresy. You just st twisting truth up for your own destruction. Amen. Just go ahead and say, I just want to live like hell and disobey everybody. Amen. Don't try to take it and use the Bible to advantage your life and act like you're living for God. That's what a lot of people do. But they ain't going to throw away what the truth is. He says, shall a man leave his father and mother cleaving to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Amen. This verse defines a genuine marriage in the original sense. Ephesians 5, verse 30 through 32. The ideal marriage is between two saved people. That's the way it ought to be. I mean, you ought to get, find somebody that's saved and loves God. That's the ideal marriage. Two saved people. Joining together by God is one flesh, verse 6. But marriage per se is intercourse. And it is defined as such even when there is fornication with a harlot. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 through 18. Know you not that he that is joined with a harlot is one with a harlot? Flesh joining flesh. You lay with a harlot. That's a marriage. Preacher, I don't like that. That's just the book. So before you snub your nose if somebody's got three certificates of marriage and divorce, and you didn't lay around with 50 people, and you got one certificate, don't make you any better than them. Amen. You've been married 50 times. You just got one certificate. And you, you know what's amazing? People that only have one certificate think they're better than others that's had other certificates, even though they've had more marriages than they have probably. You know, I'm, you know I, I told you I'm trying to preach on marriage and divorce, and I, let me just throw the truths out there. A harlot. Verse 6, wherefore they are no more... Uh, twain, but one flesh, what therefore God had joined together, let no man what? That's the way it ought to be. God wants you to stay together. God don't want it to be a divorce. Uh, look at verse 7. They say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a right in the divorcement? Well, God, what's the marriage? God said, it's flesh joining flesh. And they said, well, why did Moses give a divorce? Well, that's not a, a rocket science to figure out, is it, boys? Because you're a hellion, that's why. Look what he said in verse 7. Then, then said they, why did Moses command to give a right in divorcement and to uh, put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committed the adultery, and whosoever marrieth her, which is put away, doth uh, put, put away, doth commit adultery. He said, that, uh, you did it because your hardness of heart. That's why he had to give a divorcement. And God said, you know why you should be divorced? He said, except that be in this context for fornication, cheating, it's grounds for divorce. Do you know what else is ground for divorce? Death. Well, that's kind of obvious, ain't it? You cut, you're chuckling about it, but people are crazy today. Put it away. 
And God said, if they remarry, I'm not preaching, 1 Corinthians, you go over and check it out, they have not sinned, but they will be troubled in the flesh. God doesn't want it to be that way, but that's just the way it works. But uh, marriage is flesh joining flesh. Abraham laid with Hagar, and now she's his wife. And he's got two of them. We won't say no more than that. Some of you men are amen, and y'all be coming back to homecoming with black eyes. So go back, go back, go back to Genesis chapter number 16. So a marriage. There's a lot you can say about marriage, amen. And, and just go back and read it, man. It's flesh joining flesh. It's obvious, amen. And leave father and mother, cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So I, do I need to go get married? Yes, you do, amen. Why? As a testimony to the world. Marriage. Amen. Look in verse 4. Genesis 16. The Bible said, And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she, was con she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes, and the Lord judged between me and thee. You know, trusting in the natural over God will always bring trouble in your life. What did they do? She trusted that, hey, we can make this thing happen without God. You know, anytime you get to the point in your life where you try to make something happen without God, you're going to bring trouble in your life. Hey, she's despising much. She's looking at that me strange because she's pregnant and I'm not. She's with child and I'm not. Well, what do you expect was going to happen? You, bring, you try to do something to your way instead of trusting God. What do you expect to come out of? Well, preacher, I don't know why this guy don't want to come to church. He didn't want to come to church before you married him. Why would you think getting married was going to change him? I mean, you're trusting in the natural over God. What do you expect to come out of? Kids, don't marry a hellion. Amen. He's always going to be a hellion. Unless God peradventure saves him and something happens, but the end result most of the time, they never get better, they get worse. Ask these people that are married in here. Hey, when was that wife the best? When they were courting. When was that husband the best? When they was courting. It went downhill after that. So in other words, if the courting is bad, the marriage is probably going to be way worse. Get out before you make a mess. That's the warning signs. You get in their best behavior while y'all courting. He's acting like held in. He ain't going to get better. He's more likely going to get worse. Don't trust the natural. Amen. Look, look, look in verse 6. And Abram said to Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dwelt hardly with her, she fled from her face. You, you know, we, can, we can't run from our sin like it never happened. You know what we want to do? We'll just run. Where are you going to run to? She said, I'll just get rid of them. My wrong be upon thee and me. Hey, Amen. You can't run from your sin. Hey, Amen. Hey, you, you're going to have to face it. They're going to have to face their sin. You know what she wants to do? Just run her away and get it out of sight, out of mind. It don't always work like that. That's the way Christians live. Hey, they do wrong and it's just run it away like it never happened. Sweep it under the rug. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but he that confesseth and forsaketh, he shall find mercy. Amen. You can't run from it like it never happened. We must confess it and by God's grace deal with the consequences that come along with it. They made a mistake. Amen. They trusted in their natural over the spiritual. They trusted in their own wisdom over God's. They tried to make this thing happen without the Lord. Now there's trouble on their hands. Hey, now you got to face it and confess it, repent of it, and deal with the consequences. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. Hey, there's consequences for you wrong. You just have to deal with it, face it. You know, according to Galatians chapter 4, and we can study Galatians because Galatians uses this as a great allegory. Maybe we will later on when we pick it back up again a little bit later on in the book of Genesis. But, but this marriage began a Middle East holy war between the Arabs and the Jews till this day. I mean, you know, you know you, your sin just don't affect right now. A lot of times it just lingers along. 
And this sin that they committed, amen, is still causing deaths of people throughout history. The Arabs and the Jews are still fighting over there. You know why they're fighting over there? Because of Ishmael and Isaac that will be born later. One of promise and one of the flesh. Hagar and Sarah, Ishmael and Isaac, they're still fighting it out over there. Hey, we get Jacob that comes up later that has the 12 tribes of Israel. We call it the Israel, Israel, uh, the sons of Jacob, Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. Do you know, do you know how many sons uh, Ishmael had? 12 of them. 12 of them. Matter of fact, hey man, go back and check it out. I believe Abraham has 12 youngins with Hagar. This ain't the only one. It don't stop. It stays and lingers around. And these Arabs and Jews are still fighting it out over there. Why? Because somebody one day took matters in their own hands and said, I'll do it my way. You never know how long the consequences of your sin will linger along. You say, well, I'll just do what I want to do. You know what? No, none of us live it to himself and none of us yeah. die to ourselves. Yeah. It would be nice if it just happened that way, if you'd done it and that was the end of it. But you make decisions and you do things and then there's still repercussions down the road for it and other people are still suffering. Be careful what you do. We see this trusting in the flesh. Then we see this third part here tonight. The turning to the Father. You know what's good about it? Thank God you can turn to God. You know, even though there's a mess that's made here by trusting the flesh, God is always willing to forgive and try to restore and make the best out of the mess. That's God. God cares about you. God don't throw you away. Yes, yes, he stepped away, and yes, they trusted the flesh. Yes, they went away from God and made some wrong decisions. Yes, there's still consequences being dealt with from it, but thank God, God is merciful and willing to forgive. You can turn back to the Father. Look at this in verse number 7. And the angel of the Lord found her by the fountain of water. Here is Hagar. She fled out from the presence of Sarai, and she's laying beside this well, according to verse number 13 and 14. Verse 14, is it? Uh, wherefore the well was called Berlea Roi. She's over there beside this fountain by this well, laid out over there, fleeing away from Sarai, running away. And guess who shows up? The angel of the Lord found her by the fountain of water in the wilderness. Do you know what? God came looking for her. You know, it's a good type right here. It's a good type of salvation. God coming looking for the sinner. God coming looking, by the way, even for a saint of God that walks away from God. But it's a great picture of God saving a sinner here. Here she is fleeing away, running to the world, running back to Egypt. She goes on the way to shore. Hey, man, you know where she's heading? Straight back to Egypt. Where's she come from? Well, Abraham picked her up down there in Egypt to start with and brought her out. She's going back home. Guess who showed up? The angel of the Lord. Verse number 7, and the angel of the Lord. You know, it's the first mention of the angel of the Lord in your King James Bible. The angel of the Lord. The, what, who is the angel of the Lord? Just like the study on marriage, we're not trying to go in depth on the study of the angel of the Lord tonight. You could spend all night preaching on the marriage and divorce and remarriage, and you could spend all night preaching on the angel of the Lord. You know who the angel of the Lord simply is? It's what people call an external, external bodily, bodily appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Before he's born of the womb of Mary, virgin born son of God. They call it a theophany. It's, a, it's, it's God in the Old Testament showing up. Why? Because Jesus is God. Amen. Amen. Let me just show you. Let me show you one example here. Look in Exodus chapter 13. Exodus, excuse, Exodus chapter 3. Remember Moses went down. He's down there and God's going to tell him to go down there and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Exodus chapter 3. And Moses has fled away from Pharaoh's house, you know. He refuses to be the son of Pharaoh's daughter, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And he gets down there on the backside of that desert, and he sees this burning bush. Moses, Exodus chapter 3. And Moses is out there, and God's trying to speak to him through that burning bush. That flame, that fire, that's, that bush that's on fire that's not being consumed. In uh, Exodus ch chapter number 3, look in verse number 13. You got that? What's the first word there? And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel. God's already told Moses, you go back and read chapter 3. He said, Go down and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses says this to God. Moses said to God, Behold, 
When I come unto the children of Israel and, say, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers have sent me unto you, and they shall say unto me, What is his name? And what shall I say unto them? He said, Go down and tell Pharaoh to let my people go, and go down and tell these uh, uh, Israelites that I'm coming down to deliver you out of the bondage of Egypt. And Moses said, Hey, when I get down there and they say, What's your God's name? He said, What am I going to tell them? Look what it says in verse 14. And God said unto Moses, look, all caps in your King James Bible. You see that standing out right there? I am that I am. Amen. He said, what am I telling my name is? I am that I am. Amen. You remember, Does that not ring bells in your New Testament mind about the Lord Jesus Christ? I am the well of life. I am the bread. I, I am I am the door. Who is that? That's Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Amen. That's God in the Old Testament. You know what that makes God? Jesus Christ. Amen. You know what that makes Jesus Christ? God. You say, well, I don't understand that. How can it be a God, a Father, a Son, the Holy Ghost? I don't know neither, but that's God. Yeah, I ain't got to figure it out in my mind. I just got to believe what he said. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Some of you are trying to figure it all out. I got to make it work in my brain. Your brain ain't big enough to figure God out. Yeah, right, right, right. You just, some things, you just got to believe God. Yeah. You say, preacher, that's kind of like stupid there, ain't it? Just to believe something I can't figure it out in my mind? Yeah. You call it whatever you want to call it. I call it faith. Yeah, believe in what the word. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If the word of God says something and I can't comprehend it in my mind, I'm just going to believe the word of God. And one day maybe God will let me figure it out or maybe when I get to glory God will let me know, but it ain't going to cause me not to believe what he said. That's what's wrong with most people in the world. Well, I can't figure it out out in all my intellect. You wait in your intellect to figure it all out, you're going to die and go to hell with your intellect. He said, look, look. He said, this is what you tell them. I am that I am. And he said, and, and he said, thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, I am, all caps again, have sent me unto you. Listen to this right here. This is pretty good. Amen. Here begins... Uh, 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 let's see, verse 14. For some reason, the King James translators took it upon themselves to capitalize seven words. I don't think they just took it upon themselves. I believe God used them that way, don't you? But that's what people say, you know. I am that I am, I am. That's what he called himself. If you add this to the second revelation God gave, look in Exodus chapter 6, verse 3. Look at this. Exodus 6, verse 3. He said, Who am I going to tell him I, who sent me? What's his name? He said, I am that I am. He said, I am have sent thee. So I am that I am, I am. That's his name. Look in Exodus 6, verse 3. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, but by my name, all caps, what? Jehovah, was I not known unto them. They said this, if you add the revelation of Je Exodus 3, 14, I am that I am that I am have sent thee, and my name is Jehovah, you know what you'd have to say God's name is? I am that I am, I am Jehovah. Yeah. All caps. Yeah. That's him. You say, what's that got to do with the angel of the Lord? <laughs> That's a good question. Look in Acts chapter 7. It is a good question. Acts 7. So who is God? He said, I am that I am. I am Jehovah. Acts chapter 7, Stephen's over here preaching before he gets stoned to death, right? And they gnash on him with their teeth, stone him to death, and God's standing at the right hand of the Father and all that stuff going on. But before all that happens, Stephen goes to preaching to these people, and he goes back to rehearsing the history of God dealing with the children of Israel. He's trying to show them how Jesus Christ was through all this lineage. Look in Acts chapter 7, verse 30. Well, you can go back to verse 29. It, this is the context of Je Exodus 3. Then fled Moses, Acts 7, 29, at the same, and was a stranger in the land of Madan, where he begat two sons. That's when he fled from Pharaoh, went down to that desert, and he got those sons, he got that wife, and, and went, look, look at verse 30. And when 40 years were expired, there appeared unto him uh, in the wilderness of Mount Sinai a an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. What did he call it? He said that was the angel of the Lord. Well, when God, when, he, when that angel of the Lord was talking to Moses, 
Moses saw that flame of fire. Uh, 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 Stephen said that was the angel of the Lord. Do you know what the angel of the Lord said his name was? I am that I am. I am Jehovah. You know who the angel of the Lord is? He's Jehovah. You know who Jehovah is? He's Jesus Christ. He's the I am. You know who that Old Testament appearance is that the angel of the Lord? It's God showing up. Who is it? He's Jesus Christ. Theophany. Jesus Christ showing up in the Old Testament. Amen. Look back in Acts, uh, uh, Genesis chapter 16. So we see this angel of the Lord showing up, speaking uh, to who? Hagar. First time he ever shows up in your Bible. He's God. He's Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Man has sinned against God. It's obvious what's happened here. Abram and Sarah chose to trust their flesh, went against God, sinned against God. And in God's wisdom and grace, he interferes to try to make something out of their mess. Uh, Abraham and Sarah sin. They sent Hagar off out in the desert in the wilderness. They get away from here. We're going to cover up our sin. And the angel of the Lord shows up and says, Listen, you ain't got to do it that way. I can make something out of your mess if you just trust me. And the angel of the Lord interjects himself and shows up. While they're trying to cover up their sin, God's coming to try to give help. God came to Hagar. You know, is that not God in the New Testament? Amen. He come, Luke 19, 10, to seek and to save that which is lost. Here's Hagar. She went out to the wilderness, and the angel of the Lord shows up. Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, Jehovah God in the form of an angel. I am that I am has showed up. Hey, to this old woman out here that's been thrown away by the world. That herself has chose to go back to the world to try to make something out of her life. And while she's trying to make something out of her life and go to the world and her life's a mess and her life's all destroyed, the angel of the Lord showed up right on time. Hey, hey, you remember that day your life was a mess and you just threw up your head and said, what's the word use? What's, what's, the, what's the use of living? What's the use of going any further? I believe I'll just quit. And God says, hey, I got you right where I want you right now. And he came to where you was. God is interested in helping us in our troubles. Amen. He, she sent her running. Here's a good little thought. Let me throw this one out. Amen. This is like a little rabbit thought here. Look in Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs 21. Look at this. You know, you know who sent her away? Sarah. She didn't want to do with her. Proverbs 21. Psalms, Proverbs. Let me find it here. And she ran her away. And you know where she went? You got Proverbs 21. Look in Genesis 16 at the same time. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness. By the fountain in the way to Shur. Shur is the direction towards Egypt. And she's out there in that wilderness. She's out there away from Sarah that's mad at her. Solomon said this, Proverbs chapter number 21, verse number 19. You see that? 21, 19. It is better to dwell in the wilderness. That's where she's at. Than with a contentious and an angry woman. I wonder if Solomon was thinking about that when he wrote it, that story right there. It's better for that lady to be out in the wilderness than that contentious woman, Sarah. I don't know. Go back to Genesis 16. Let's just throw that out there. I read that. Somebody else said it. I thought it was pretty good. Amen. She ran. And God said it's better to be out in the wilderness than to stay in that mess. The first person, isn't this amazing? The angel of the Lord showed up. God, Jehovah God, in the form of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. The angel, the first time he shows up in your Bible, he shows up to an Egyptian woman whose life is a mess. It, it, the angel of the Lord, it, does, it doesn't say when he showed up the first time that he spoke to Abraham, spoke to Adam. Then we know God did, but we're just talking about the angel of the Lord, that phrase, that, that, that person showing up in your Bible. The first time it shows up is to an Egyptian woman whose life is a mess. The angel of the Lord showed up to this maid, amen, on the way to uh, 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 Egypt uh, by the way of Shur. You know, you know the first time that 
the gospel is presented in the New Testament in the sense that we believe it today is found in Acts chapter number 8. You know the first time it's presented out real clear who it came to? It's amazing how God does things like that, kind of tie things together. Here's an Egyptian woman going out there in the world, and the angel of the Lord shows up to save her life. Threw away. She's a throwaway Hamite is what she was, an Egyptian, a Hamite, right? The servant of servants, the Bible called her. You know when the Bible shows up and shows the gospel the first time over in Acts chapter number 8 that we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, resurrection of Jesus Christ when Philip was led of the Spirit in the wilderness? You know what he found down there in that chariot? An Ethiopian eunuch, a Hamite, a black man, coming back, amen. Hey, this black man was rich. This old black girl, her, she was poor. But you know, the first time the angel of the Lord shows up is just the same as the type of the New Testament when the gospel is presented in the New Testament to that Hamite sent over there in, in uh, 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 of, of Candace. I don't know. I, God's doing something right there, amen. On her way to Egypt by a well. She's sitting there by that well. You remember Jesus Christ showing up in John chapter number four, going over to buy that well? That woman that was unfit, didn't fit and fit along with the society, thrown away because she didn't have all these husbands, her life was a mess, and Jesus sat on Jacob's well. Ain't there, ain't there a lot of similarities here? A lot of truths being shown about salvation, how God to deliver somebody, and he gave her a, 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 a drink of the water of life to spring up in the everlasting life. You know what, God's coming here, the angel of the Lord showing up that little Hamite girl over there, her life's threw away, she's heading back to Egypt for hope, and God said, don't go to Egypt, just come to me, I got what you need. Shows up. At a well. What was the well? Well, according to verse 7, the well was in the wilderness. Found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness. Amen. There was a, in the wilderness, it was by the fountain where God revealed himself unto her. You, you, you know how a sinner gets saved? Drinking of that well of life. You know where you got to find yourself in the wilderness? She's in the wilderness of her life. You know when you got saved, you're in the wilderness of your life. A sinner finds Christ away from the luxuries of this world. It was in the wilderness. Her life was a mess. She's giving up. What's the use? I'm running away and I'm going back to Egypt. And you get like that in your life and you give up and you realize there's no hope in this whole world, God's got you where he wants you. Amen. You know why a lot of people can't get saved? And I know why people go to hell because they reject the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But they go a lot of different routes to get there. Some people just can't let go of this old stinking world. When you get sick and tired of this old world, sick and tired of your life, God's got your number. And the angel of the Lord said, hey, now I'm coming. He found her in the wilderness. He found her by the fountain. You know where you'll find Christ? Away from the luxury of this world, and you'll find him in the fountain of this old book right here. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's where God will reveal himself to a sinner that has given up on life and said, I just can't make it no more. And he says, listen, I got what you need. He came looking for her. He came right by that well and found her where she needed to be founded. Found, excuse me, founded. Look in verse 8. And he said to Hagar, the angel of the Lord shows up. She's out there by that well. You get the picture? She's give up. I'm just going back to Egypt. She's on the way to shore. You know, by the way, he's a sure foundation. Amen. Different spelling, different word altogether too. The sure, S-H-U-R, there's that place. But she's going that way and the angel of the Lord showed up and she's sitting there by that well. And the Bible says in verse 8, and, and he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid. Look at the first question he said. Whence camest thou? You don't think he knew where she come from? You better believe he did. Just like Adam, where art thou? You don't think he knew where he was? Hey, hey, just like when he showed up to you, you don't think he knew where you'd been? Whence comest thou? Where'd you come from? Yeah, he knew. You know what he wants you to do? He just wants you to be honest and answer. It's top of God calling a sinner here. Whence comest thou? Look what else he said. Look what he said. Verse, the, the two questions here. Verse 8. And he said to Hagar, Sarah's maid, Whence comest thou, number one, and whither wilt thou go? Hey, lady, where'd you come from? And by the way, where are you going? You know what God will do to every sinner? When he comes to you, the angel of the Lord shows up and conviction of the Holy Ghost on your life. He's going to want to know where you've been. You got to face your sin. And by the way, where are you going? 
If you died right now, would you go to heaven or hell? Where are you heading? You know where you're going? You better know where you're going. But you better first recognize and realize and repent of where you've been. Whence comest thou? We must face our sin. Where you been? And where you going? Do you know you can know where you're going? A lot of people in the world say, well, I can't know where I'm going. Why not? You know where you've been, right? You can know where you're going. These things have been written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. You say, preacher, you can't know whether you're saved or not. Well, 1 John 5, 13 sure says you can. Amen. Well, I don't know about that. Well, I just believe the book. Amen. Well, we'll find out when we get there. If you're waiting to find out when you get there, you might be in bad shape and never get there. Amen. You can know where you're going. He said, where you been? He said, where you going? He said, I, got, he, I see the questions, but number, uh, number three here, I see the remedy. Look in verse 9. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself unto her hands. What's the remedy? Well, grace saw her. She didn't deserve it. God showed up out of nowhere. She's out there in the wilderness. Her life was a mess. He sat by that well, and grace came to where she was. And then righteousness commanded her. Grace saw her. And righteousness counseled her. He said, here's where you go. He said, go back. The grace of God that bringeth salvation have appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying and godliness and worldly love, we shall live righteously and soberly. Grace sought you, righteousness counseled you. God said, now that you're saved, go forward. Here's the answer. Go back to where you come from. You know what God wants you to do? Face up to your sin. We don't face up to nothing. But you're going to have to face it. You know what he tells her to go back? He told her to go back and be a servant. Go back to thy mistress. Return and submit thyself under her hand. You find this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 20 through 24. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5 through 9. Uh, the principle of a servant, how they ought to obey their master. He said, return and submit. Repent and submission is what we need. Go back. Do you know if you'll heed the remedy of God, in this case a lot different, but the remedy for our soul, it'll come with some assurance in your life. You know why a lot of people ain't got no assurance? Because they just won't do right. Look at verse 10. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. He said, go back and submit, and I'm going to, you know what he comes back in verse 10? Assurance. You know what God wants to give you today? Assurance. Look at the promise, verse 11. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord have heard thy affliction. We said this last week. That's the first person ever given a name before they were born. Ishmael. See, that's what you're going to call him. He ain't even born yet and gave him a name. The second one was Isaac, the next child, the promised child. He's given a name before he's ever born. I think somebody said there's 11 people in your King James Bible that were given names before they were born. Two of them in the New Testament. You know who they were? John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. Given a name before the birth. He said, here's the promise. The word Ishmael, they said, means God shall hear. You imagine God gave her that child and said his name's going to be Ishmael, and every time she calls his name, it reminds her that God's heard her. God heard you. God heard your cry when you was in a mess. God heard my cry when I was in a mess. Thank God he hears the promise. Verse 12, and he will be a wild man, and his hand will be against every man, just as them Arabs are today, every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the pre uh, presence of all his brethren. Here he is, Ishmael. Hey, you, 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 great study. We might, I told you we might look at it later in the book of Galatians. Here's Ishmael and here's Isaac. Ishmael's a type of the flesh and Isaac's a type of the spirit. One's a type of the new birth. The other's a type of the old man. That new man's a promise. Isaac, thank God for him, the new birth. But that old flesh, Ishmael, that we all told around, he's a wild man. His hand's against everything. You know where you get all your trouble from? Your flesh. Your Ishmael. He's wild, man. You can't tame him. Amen. You just try to get him to submit to the Spirit of God and try to go forward with the Lord. 
but he's against everything. Flesh fighting against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These two are contrary one to another. That's the truth there. He's a wild man. Amen. But God said, I'm going I'm to bless you. I'm going to make something out of it. He made a promise. And then look at the memorial, verse 13. And she called the name of the, uh, uh, the, uh, she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. That's what she called him. Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Well, thank God he sees. Wherefore the well was called Bera Ber Lehora, uh, Lehora. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. She made it a memorial. This was the place where I met God. This is the place where God done something special in my life. You ever have some memorials in your life that set up things that remind you of what God done for you? The place like where he saved you. The place where you maybe submitted your life to the Lord. Well, God answered a prayer here. Some memorials in your life. God done something special for you. This was a special place to her. That well was special. She called the name of that place, God seeth me. Called it Bar Lehoroi. And the Bible says in verse 15, And Hagar bare Abraham a son, and Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare him Ishmael. I wonder if the Lord went back and told Abraham, or Abram, what to name him, or Hagar came back and said, This is what the Lord told me, this is what we're going to name him. And Abram was four score and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. A memorial. She set it up as a place. So what do we see here? We see this trial of their faith. God tried them. God will try you. God will try me. And sometimes we mess up the trial by trusting in the flesh. But thank God, by God's grace and mercy, we can turn back to the Father. He's willing to forgive. He's a faithful God. Amen. And we'll stop right there and pick up chapter 17 next time. Amen. Everybody stand. Continue to remember one another in prayer. If you're able to stay around and help with the fellowship hall, that would be great. Pray for uh, homecoming coming up Sunday.